Praise God. You're in the house of the Lord. It's a good place to be. It's a great place to start off the week. It's a great place to start afresh. It's a great place for a new beginning. Praise God for that time of worship. Well, it's my privilege to introduce our, our next guest. Um, yeah, but before I do, you know, Monjess said, you know, are there any announcements? And I said, yeah, this, 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 and this. And then I forgot to say that Sarah DeBrawl had her fourth child this, this last week, and, and Jonathan and his family were taking care of not only his kids, but Sarah's kids. So I'm sure that was a lively place this week. But, but praise God, uh, Sarah, we pray, continue to pray for her, and we thank God for a safe delivery of a baby boy, seven pounds, eight ounces. And uh, so we also pray for Brittany. She's expecting, so pray for her continued health. Um, well, it's my privilege to introduce our next guest, and I must say, as I was standing there during worship, Sitting next to our next guest, I was thinking, wow, Charlene, thank you for that story of David and Goliath, because I felt like David standing next to Steve. He's so big and tall, but uh, he's on the good side. He's on the, the, uh, the, the Christian side. So he's no enemy. He's our friend. We've known Steve for a long time at this church, and... Uh, He's been, he's been a Christian for 33 years, and he went, now I'm going to, he sent it to me, so I better, if he took, takes the time to tell it to me, he went to, uh, he graduated from Hardin-Simmons University, it's a Baptist school in Texas, uh, he's been married 20 years, praise God, he's got three kids, one of which, Caleb, I love that name, is here, and he's been laboring. Uh, in ministry for the first nine years in youth ministry, and then the next 17 years with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And we got together a while ago, about, I don't know, three months ago, and I thought it would be a great idea to have him come in and share from his perspective, because he's in and around public schools all the time, to give us insight to, let's face it, there's... There's battles even in schools, right? And what are, what's trying to, they're trying to get the minds of the young ones. So how do we navigate that as parents, as, uh, as believers, and then also for, for the children? So I thought it would be a great time to have Steve come up here and share the truth of the gospel, but from his perspective of working with youth and in the school system. So Steve... Please come on up. We welcome you. Thank God for you being here. Yep. Thank you all for having me. Um, I knew Pastor Corder a little bit, and um, I know Jonathan and Gary Moore and uh, Jody, and um, got to, you know, start uh, getting to know Pastor Mitch recently, and I'm just really um, thankful for the support of the church. The church supports my work financially, which I couldn't, uh, couldn't do it without um, that so thank you. Um, one of my favorite verses when dealing with hard times is John sixteen thirty three, where Jesus says, "These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world." And we know that in Christ we have eternal victory. But I want to focus on the here and the now uh, for this message. Um, and I want to talk about our faith in relationship to public schools, but also just in relationship to when we're dealing with any challenging situations uh, in the world. Um, if you have your Bible with you and you want to turn ahead of time, we will spend a little bit of time in Romans 8 and 10. Uh, but all the verses will be up on the screen, and we're going to kind of fly through some other verses as well. And I trust that you all can keep up, because I know everyone in here is an athlete. All of you wrestle with something, 
and all of you are running the race for Jesus, right? So we're all athletes, so I'm speaking to athletes here. So I'm going to, uh, my wife always says, you try to pack too much in, and I do. I just get all excited when I'm playing and pr- uh, praying and planning, and I'm going to pack too much in, but I trust you can keep up because you're athletes, right? Um, so Pastor Mitch told me that the church recently went through Second Thessalonians, uh, and one of the words of warning in there is let no one deceive you and also to stand firm. And both those challenges, both those encouragements are just as important now as they ever were. Uh, we live in the age of information. And now that everybody can, through social media can create inf- information, right, it's really hard sometimes to tell what's information and what's misinformation and then what's just straight up attempts at deception. Uh, And we really have to be discerning and wrestle with what's true and what's false. The Bible tells us to not let anyone deceive us. That's usually associated with the gospel, not being tricked into believing a version of the gospel that isn't true. But also, along the lines of truth, the Bible speaks about not being a false witness, not giving false reports. In um, regarding truth, in the Proverbs, it says, like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their neighbor and says, I was only joking. So the point of all these verses is that, uh, along with the lines of deception and truth, is that we as Christ followers are supposed to have our lives marked by being people of clear truth, along with discernment and wisdom. We're told to speak the truth in love. One of the hardest things to do sometimes. Jesus is the truth. We're told to put on the belt of truth, which when Paul was talking about the armor of God, the belt was the thing that held everything connected to it. Uh, And I once heard a pastor say, like a belt holds up your pants, the truth will hold up your reputation. As people of truth, with God on our side, We don't need to manipulate words, facts, stats, or numbers. Our fear sometimes will make us want to do that, our insecurities, but it's unnecessary. We need to learn to trust God and trust that he knows the truth. He can handle the truth. He can even work through the truth when it seems like bad news to us. He's not afraid. He doesn't need our manipulation. We have a God that even works through through, not despite of, but through our weaknesses. So when I talk about how well I played in a basketball game, I don't need to manipulate that. When I talk about how big my fish was, I don't need to manipulate that. When I talk about how my ministry is going, I don't just need to share the good stuff. I can share the hard things too. When we talk about what appears to be a large number of people leaving churches in the Western world or walking away from the faith in Europe and the United States, we don't need to be afraid. As far as I can tell, it does seem to, to be that faith, religion, and Christianity are on decline in much of the Western world. Not all of it, but much of it. Yet, there's a predicted incline of the faith coming up in Brazil. Christianity appears to be on the rise in Africa, China, in Indonesia. In fact, uh, I've gotten to meet some of our FCA staff in Southeast Asia, um, being fully funded in in Muslim countries. Uh, It's incredible. And there's lots of great questions that come along with, with these kind of topics. What's causing all this? What is God up to? What are we doing? What's our priorities? How well are we doing what we're doing? So now let's kind of shift that thought towards the public school. Yes, there are plenty of problems in the public schools. We live in a a challenging, pluralistic society, and we see the challenges that come with the public schools. My wife was a public school educator for 20 years, 19 years of it here in Fairfax County, and she recently stepped out to start her own learning center. Um, We've had our kids in private schools. We've had them in public schools. My oldest graduated from public school. I graduated from public school. Caleb's in public school right now, but they've been in private. But for our daughter, she's in uh, homeschool right now. Um, In the public school, yes, there are some agendas going on. 
There is some weak leadership in some areas of the public school system. There's a lack of discipline, but that's going on in some of our homes too. And there's a lot of fear mixed in with all of it. And, and I hear well-meaning but incorrect statements about the faith in the public schools too. Uh, a lot of times, our response to these problems is reflective of our response to other problems, and it's we come off as defeated or easily defeatable. Sometimes the way people, I see brothers and sisters in Christ respond to some of these issues, we seem more like the spies that went into the promised land and came back with fear. There were two out of the, the 12 spies believed, Caleb and Joshua, Despite the, the bad reports, despite, and I'm not saying let's deny the truth. No, let's be realistic, but let's have real faith too. Only two of the 12 spies did that, Joshua and Caleb. And Israel paid a price for being afraid and not believing. I'm not making against, an accusation against anybody here, okay? I just want to encourage us to be on guard. Now, I know what people mean when they say these statements. Don't fry me afterwards. I, I, I know what they're getting at. But what if the way we communicate these things confuses more people into believing that something is true when it isn't? We've got to be really, really wise with the words we choose. The Bible says we will be judged for every careless word. Here's some examples of some of the things I hear about public schools. Bibles can't be read in public schools, but they can be read in prison. Perhaps if we let them read it in the public schools, they wouldn't go to prison. Yeah, I agree with that, except Bibles can be read in the public school. The public school is up to brainwashing and indoctrination. A little bit of that is going on. But it's only as much as somebody is brainwashable. We need to be discerning. We need to stand firm. They took God out of public schools. I get what they mean. They stopped teaching about God. He stopped becoming part of the curriculum. But took him out of public schools as if they could. Our God is not limited to a teacher's lesson about him. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not saying let's ignore these problems or threats. I'm just saying, let's be real, let's be truthful, let's not be afraid, let's be on guard, and don't lose sight of the power that we do have. We're going to fly through some scriptures here that I see play out in all of this. First one is 2 Timothy 1, 6-7. It says, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you through laying on of my hands. So, Oh, let me continue. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-discipline. We're not supposed to be people of fear. We're supposed to be focused on fanning into flame the gifts that God has given us. Spiritual gifts, talents, whatever it may be. Focus on fanning those into flame. God has not given us a spirit of fear, and he gives us right here the antidote to fear. Focusing on power, Love and self-discipline. What power has God given us? How can love overcome some of these obstacles? What, what can self-discipline do to get me through this moment of fear? 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 through 58. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor, which is not there, it's here, your labor is not in vain. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Jesus Christ. It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, we, most of us in America, haven't faced this. Uh, I do have an t- uh, FCA teammate who's been to prison seven times for sharing his faith. And he's just, he knows it'll only be a matter of time before he goes for the eighth time. Um, but we do get persecuted. We do, we do feel the oppression sometimes. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, even a bad policy in the school system, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10, 14 through 15 and 20 through 21. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Now, most of us probably a little insecure about our feet, right? But if you're bringing the gospel, you have beautiful feet. Who brings glad tidings of great things? But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, in the public school system, I hear about and see some disobedient and contrary people. Are a lot of the people that I minister to them and amongst them contrary? Yes. And the coaches and the teachers that I'm talking to and my son Caleb has to deal with some of them in his classes. Are some of them disobedient? Yes. Do they all hear? No. Do they all believe? No. But some do. And I get to help them in that process. The truth of God, it works in me and through me. But it's not just about me. It's about the brothers and sisters in Christ that are already in our public schools every day living out their faith. It's everybody from the teacher who is teaching uh, world history and teaches about all the religions and represents well her faith. And when is asked directly by her students, are you a Christian? Says yes. It's about Caleb and his buddies talking about faith at their lunch table, even though not all of them are believers. It's about Caleb and other students like him who are living their faith out, representing it well on their sports teams and in their classes and on their clubs. Several days a week, I'm on public school campuses, and here's what I'm a part of, and here's what I see, and here's what's happening. There are teachers that are praying together before school. There are Bible-believing Christians that are administrators, coaches, and teachers. There are students that gather together for Bible study, prayer, worship, teaching, and edifying each other in the Lord. I'd like to tell you about how it looks through FCA um, and glorify the, the, a little bit about some of the scriptures that go behind it that, that fuel it all. Um, and, and FCA's vision is to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. And here's a couple of the ways that that happens through FCA. 
One role is called a character coach role. A character coach is a volunteer or a FCA staff person that comes alongside a sports team for the entire season and teaches the team on character values that will help them on and off the field, most of which are Christian values. Um, you're, you're, you've got an audience with the, whole, with the whole team, and they have to be at some of these attending uh, meetings, and they have to attend. So you have to be careful about what you say. Um, but we're definitely pointing them indirectly to Christ in the character coach role. And I've got a picture, uh, if you could pull the picture up. That's me um, with the Lake Braddock football team. Five seasons I've been with them. I'm with them once or twice a week at practice. I'll usually give like a life lesson after practice. I give, uh, I'll speak to them at their pregame meals uh, about character values that will help them on and off the field. Uh, and sometimes I'll even be able to slip in a Bible lesson and say, look guys, I'm not going to tell you what to believe about the Bible, but I'm going to bring a story from the Bible that I think applies to all of us, and then I'll deliver the lesson. And then I'm there, you know, talking with them on the sidelines. Um, some of them will ask me advice after practice or in the locker room. Uh, I'm there helping the coaches take some of the weight off them by setting up equipment and taking it down. Um, and just trying to be there to support. Uh, there are uh, also what we have uh, called huddles. And huddles are meetings that happen on, on school campuses. And there's some pictures of that. On the top left is Annandale. They meet 7.30 in the morning before school. Oh, they're about once a month right now. We're hoping to make that more frequent. Uh, on the bottom left is Lake Braddock's meeting every Thursday morning, 7.30 a.m. Uh, they've had up to 40 students gather this year, and they've done some service projects around the school and uh, for some, some uh, missions as well in the area. Bottom right is um, Centerville High School, where they had an event called Fields of Faith, and they just did out a public invitation to any students in the school who wanted to come out and hear some of their peers share their testimony. And then top right is not actually FCA. Uh, it's a student club called Crossfire. And uh, you might see a familiar face. In fact, he's wearing the same hoodie. Uh, and that's at Edison High School. Uh, but there's several athletes in that group. And uh, I know Mr. Bushman is the teacher sponsor in the back. His dad was my Bible study teacher back when I was 17 years old. Uh, so we go back a long way. Um, so that's some of the huddles that go on. Uh, Crossfire meets every other Wednesday or Thursday after school. And they get together, they pray, they go through scripture together and, uh, and teach each other what God's doing in their life and have a great time together. Uh, a third thing is our camps. And we've got a picture of one of our camps. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We, yeah, we can go ahead and bring that picture up. That's fine. So churches will help support some of our work sometimes. And it might look like bagging lunches for a football team uh, where the church gets together all the supplies, they bag it, they take it over to the football team for the team getting ready to head away for one of their away games uh, and putting encouraging notes in there. It might look like on the right uh, at Falls Church High School, the teacher on the left side of the picture is Mr. Harlow. He's an adaptive PE teacher, so teaching PE classes for special needs students. And uh, the vid he has video games in his room, and it helps some of the adaptive students with their hand-eye coordination. Also, the teachers love coming down on their lunch breaks and playing some video games, too. Uh, and so a church donated money to the Falls Church FCA, which is the students and teacher on the right, and they chose what to do with that money to bless their school, and so they bought a video game for Mr. Harlow's room, and, and that was the support, support of a church. And that's just two examples of hundreds of ways a church can show the love of Christ to a public school. And then another thing is our camps. So every summer we have sports camps, and a lot of these students will be, either become Christ followers for the first time or deepen their walk with Christ and go back to their public schools uh, at the beginning of the school year. And we had almost uh, 400 junior high and high school athletes at our last camp uh, last summer. 
um, where they get two practices a day in their sport. They get Bible studies led by a college student who's involved in FCA, and then they all come together for a big assembly at the end of every day of camp uh, where they'll get crowd games and then worship and skits that glorify Jesus and then teaching from the Bible. Uh, this last one happened at Eastern Mennonite University, uh, and it's going on there again this summer, the last week of June. And then uh, we found out that in two summers, our camps will start happening at Liberty University. So we're pretty excited about that. Really, really nice facility. So it's going to be fun. Um, we're always looking for, for volunteers to help out. And it doesn't even have to be FCA. I, yes, I'm, I work for FCA. I'm all about it. But to see ministry happening on campus, whether it's us, whether it's Young Life, whether it's a, an independent club like Crossfire, whether it's Woodson Christian Fellowship, whether it's the Bible study that happens on Fridays at Lake Braddock, that, that's a win for the kingdom, and that's ultimately what, what I'm all about. And so I just want us to be encouraged that God is not only glorified through our strength, but even more so through our weaknesses. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 to 10. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I see God work through teenagers on the public school campus. Not just leading each other, but moments of them leading adults as well. One example would be that uh, the Lake Braddock football coach for the football banquet last year, uh, had, he, he had asked me if I would sit, give a blessing before the meal. Uh, and there was a really strong student leader on the football team, and I said it would be even better if it came through uh, Jeb. And so Jeb led the prayer uh, in front of all his football teammates, their parents, all the coaches, staff. Um, just the other day, he texted me, Coach Abel, what do you think of Christian existentialism? So I got some homework to do now on that. So incredible young man. Um, I've seen God work through my lack of credentials. I haven't been to seminary. I went to Bible college, took some classes, jumped right into youth ministry out of Bible college. He works through me despite my lack of credentials all the time. He even worked through me when I was running late one day. Um, we, you know, Northern Virginia, we never like to be late. We're always very punctual, rushing to go to the next place. I was, walk, I was running late to a huddle at West Springfield. I'm walking down the hall, dealing with that awkward moment of walking in the door late, and, you know, everybody's heads turned and see who it is walking late through the door. And I'm walking down the hall, and then there's two girls coming this way. And one is almost physically dragging the other down the hall. She's got on some shoes that are sliding, and we meet right in front of the door where the, the FCA meeting is happening. And I'm like, hey, y'all, what's going on? And they're just both kind of like laughing and giddy. And w well, one looks a little nervous. And I was like, are y'all going into FCA? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, well, hey, I'm Steve. I work for FCA. Glad you're here. I was like, you look nervous. And she's like, well, I've never been to church before. I don't know what to do. Am I going to have to say anything or do anything? And so I started talking to her about what the meeting's going to be like. Feel free to just come in. I was like, they're going to play a game, and then they're going to get some food, and then they'll sit down, and somebody will present a lesson, and then they'll talk about it in small groups. You don't have to say anything, and if you have any questions afterwards, just let me know. You know, anything at all. And while I'm talking to her about what it's like, her friend that is trying to bring her to the meeting leaves us and goes in the meeting. So I'm out here with this strange girl, just trying to assure her it's going to be all right. So we walk in together. She loves it. She comes back every week, and she starts going to church with her friend. So even running late, God can use us. Um, with, with a God like that, how can we not see victory? How can we not believe we're going to see victories? Now, 
discernment and wisdom. Um, for those of you that are parents or may be a parent one day, you have to pray for wisdom when it comes to what your child is involved in. It's between you and the Lord. I am not up here plugging public school, okay? Um, as to our three kids, like I said, they've been in private school. They're in public school. One is home school. It's different from kid to kid sometimes, what the Lord has in store for you. I just want us to not view the public school as some enemy that we cannot overcome. I want us to pray for the public schools. Pray for the Christians in the schools. Pray for those who will become believers in the public school. That was my testimony. Uh, freshman and sophomore year, I was not a believer. I was not even going to church. Junior and senior year, I was trying to live out my newfound faith in the public school system. And pray for if God, is, if God is calling you, not if I'm calling you, if God is calling you to make a difference somehow in the public schools. And if so, I'd be glad to connect and talk through what that can look like. If not, um, just be praying about where God does want you to make a difference. And thank you for being a church that supports me. Um, lastly, not everyone is called to the same ministry. So wherever you are, whatever your sphere of influence, have confidence in God, in faith, in loving courageously, and in shining the light of truth through encouragement that Jesus is Lord and that everyone is created in his image. Thank you so much for having me. God bless you guys.